Welcome to Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care, an educational podcast for individuals needing long-term care and their families. Join us as we talk with national experts and advocates about strategies you can use in the pursuit of quality long-term care. M.T. Connolly is a writer, lawyer, researcher, policy shaper, and leading national expert on elder justice. In her new book, The Measure of Our Age, Navigating Care, Safety, Money, and Meaning Later in Life, MT discusses the challenges of aging, how things go wrong, and presents powerful tools we can use to forge better long lives for ourselves, our families, and our communities. In this episode, join our discussion with MT Connolly as we talk about the challenges of aging well, ageism, and advocacy for a better long-term care system. Okay, hello, and welcome to our podcast, Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care. I'm Lori Smetanka, Executive Director of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care, and we're thrilled to have you with us today, joining and listening into today's episode. Um, I am really delighted to have as our special guest today, M.T. Connolly, who is a friend and colleague and who we're just thrilled to have joining us for today's episode. M.T. is a leading national expert on elder justice. She is a MacArthur Genius Grant awardee, and she is the author of a recently released book called The Measure of Our Age, Navigating Care, Safety, Money, and Meaning in Later Life. It's really an excellent book, and I highly recommend it to all of you. Um, MT was the architect of the Federal Elder Justice Act, which I know many of you have heard us talk about before and have advocated for um, with other colleagues. She is also the founder of the Department of Justice's Elder Justice Initiative, and she's the lead author of the Elder Justice Roadmap, Shaping Federal, State, and Local Research Policy and Practice. MT is also the co-designer of the community-based RISE model intended to introduce holistic, hopeful, and effective ways to empower older adults, reduce harms, and promote elder justice. And in her book, The Measure of Our Age, MT discusses the challenges of aging, how things go wrong, and presents powerful tools that we can use to forge better, long lives for ourselves, our families, and our communities. And um, so welcome, MT. Glad to have you with us today. So happy to be with you, Lori. Thanks for having me. Well, I loved this book. I really enjoyed reading it. Your writing style is uh, just so easy reading, and I love how you weave stories and examples and your own experiences throughout the entire book. Um, And again, just really highly recommend it to everyone. So congratulations on such a really wonderful book. I know this is a lot of love for you. (laughs) Let's just say it had a very long gestation. (laughs) Thank you. Well, it's really wonderful. So tell me, um, what prompted you to want to write this book? I'm first going to start with a thank you um, to Consumer Mm -hmm. Voice, because one of the things I learned in writing the book, both in doing my research and in interviewing you, Lori, and many of our friends and colleagues, is is the important role that Consumer Voice plays in the world and in the country, and really amplifying the word voice. And I worked with Elma early on and worked with you closely and with Um, And with Allison, and I remember during the early days of the pandemic, having a conversation with you where you were talking about starting this podcast. Yes. So congrats for launching it, because I think it's a really important forum um, to bring people together and to share ideas. So thank you for having me. Um, Really, it was um, it was born of failure. I had a wonderful editor who said, you know, A series of small failures is a much better narrative device than one long march to victory. And so certainly that's true of me too. Um, I, as you said, I started off at the Department of Justice where there had at at a time when um, there were a lot of hearings, especially in the Senate about problems in nursing homes. And so the administration started something called the Nursing Home Initiative. And I kind of, I ended (laughs) up Hadding it without really knowing very much about the problem. And so naive mm-hmm. me thought, oh, look at this terrible problem. You know, it seemed brand new to me only to learn and in digging into it, that it was a very old problem, the problem of not having better nursing homes and that they the, the sort of astonishing rates of understaffing and abuse, neglect and exploitation. Um, and so then 
you know, I was a, I was a lawyer for the Department of Justice and to every, to every hammer, a problem looks like a nail. And so I thought, <laughs> oh, lawsuits, that will be the tool to take this on. And I think we did some good in bringing some big lawsuits using primarily the False Claims Act and other fraud laws to say, to, you know, to try and hold providers accountable right. for the money. But also what I learned is that the problems are much bigger. So then I went, I ended up um, working um, with folks at the Senate on the Elder Justice Act thinking, oh, we've got co-sponsors from both parties. This is going to be a slow dance on a slick floor, you know, we'll just slide right through. <laughs> and once again, I was wrong. And, um, you know, we, uh, first of all, the bill languished for a long time, and then it was enacted with the Affordable Care Act, but there was no funding at all for five years. And then really right. just trifling funding since then with one, you know, infusion um, with COVID relief funds, but it's back down to a very insignificant amount when you look at the whole country. And so that really made me want to look more carefully at what's going on. Why is it so hard to make change in on these issues that affect every single American, every single family, every single community? And so that was why I wanted to write the book. Um, and Really, it's sort of a, I think of it as group portrait with aging, and it's sort of a love letter to the field, but also a kind of a critical examination of, like, where do we get things right? Where do we get things wrong? And what are the really big invisible obstacles that we're up against mm -hmm. um, that make it so challenging to make aging better? Well, and, you know, I I, I think you lay it out really nicely in the book, but um you know, kind of thinking about this field where advocacy is is difficult. And so I think it's helpful to have someone, you know, like you dig into it with all of the experiences that you have had. Um, because I think that, you know, with the with the popular, as you said, all of us are aging. It's This is something that affects all of us. But as our population is increasingly aging and we're going to be dealing with so many of the issues that affect people who are aging. Um, I think this book is completely timely um, as well, uh, you know, in terms of thinking through where do we go and how do we affect meaningful change for all of us so that we can age well, live well, you know, for the rest of our lives. And so you talk, you know, in your book, when you talk about aging, you talk about a longevity paradox. And so, you know, I think that kind of gets to some of the crux of what you're talking about here. And so what do you mean by that? Um, in 1900, the average American lived 38 years. By 2000 and still today, the average American is living 78 years. I mean, that's an unbelievable Huge. achievement in human history. And yet we, you know, we, we paid much more attention to extending the amount of time we have than to improving the well-being and the time that we've gained. And so that's mm -hmm. sort of the nub of the longevity paradox. And there are all kinds of different expressions of that. So for example, our lifespans are 78, but our healthy lifespans are just 66. And how we age is entwined with what happens earlier in life. So all the, you know, all the inequities and biases are built into aging. Um, so the, which means that the gifts of longevity and health are not equitably distributed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, a lot of it, I think, has to do with the fact that we don't want to think about aging individually or as a culture we you know we 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 want to i mean the way i've written about it is we want to get old but not be yeah. old yeah um, and that we really want to pay much more attention to forestalling old age than to improving it and i think that's one of the big shifts that we need to engage here because essentially by looking away from the process of aging and what that means for us individually and collectively, we're unprepared for longevity's significant challenges, but we're mm -hmm. also unprepared to embrace and appreciate what matters most. Um, mm -hmm. And so really one of the reasons I wrote the book was to 
try and give us more knowledge on both fronts to, you know, both to address the challenges or recognize them first and then address them, but also to embrace what matters most um, as individuals and families and a society. Well, and, you know, that really resonated with me because we've, you know, at Consumer Voice and, and many, you know, in the world have been talking a lot more about issues with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility. And while we talk a lot about it in the schemes of and and the in the principles related to racism, for example, ageism is also one of those areas where there needs to be better diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Yet ageism is not really talked about. When we think about aging, as you said, you know, people. Um, there's all the talk is related to healthy aging, which is fine. You know, we want to be healthier as we age and be healthier for a longer period of time. But the majority of us are going to need supports and services and long-term care at some point in our lives. And that's the piece that we don't want to address. We don't want to think about. And um, and from my perspective, it seems like it gets a lot of short shrift. And so we're just piecemealing it together. Um, and and that was a big takeaway for me from your book as well, where it's almost like you're saying, you know, kind of wake up, everybody. Let's talk about, you know, the whole spectrum of aging. It's not just about living longer, but it's about living well and ensuring that we have care and services and supports throughout our lives. Would you say that's kind of a message that you were trying to send as well? Absolutely. And that, that you know, we've, as a society, really tolerated ageism. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in on some sense, in some sense, we feel like at first it's kind of invisible, you know, like we don't actually even recognize it. Um, but it's also, I think, considered to be okay as a bias because it's just ourselves, our future selves that we're, you know, biased against or, you know, feeling prejudice about or, you know, fear and shame and disgust. I mean, it's it's really toxic stuff. Um, you know, Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote Cast, talks about old age as a cast, which I think mm -hmm. is a really powerful and important thing for us to, to think about. Um, but that means if we're not, if we don't recognize it, it then we take it into ourselves and excrete it into the culture, right? Yeah. Like I believe one reason we don't have a coherent long-term care system is because we're just, we're, we're too scared to even think about it or look at mm -hmm. it, and, you know, like, oh no, 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 no. And that, so I think it's not a victimless kind of bias. I think that right. it's a very insidious bias and that we don't, you know, there's a woman named Becca Levy, who's an epidemiologist at Yale, who's done research showing that people who have the most positive views of aging live seven and a half years longer and healthier mm -hmm. than people who have the most negative views of aging. And so, I, you know, we need to, as you said, we <laughs> we need to wake up. And, and also, as you were saying, you know, there, there's um, there's uh, there's studies showing that only eight percent of the diversity, equity, and inclusion training includes a component about ageism, um, right. and and I think it's it's short sighted in another respect too because you know these ageism magnifies other biases like ableism and racism and sexism and also economic disparities. You know, so right. people who are poor get poorer by the year, which is why we have 15 million older Americans who are below the poverty line. So mm -hmm. I think um, I, I think we have to make a better effort to take on ageism. And that starts at home. That starts in our own hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's not I mean, it's a challenge for me, too. It's a challenge for all of us. Right. It's and and it's something that we can do something about. And I think by taking a stand with ourselves, we take a stand in the culture, which we saw. Right. You know, so, for example, with the gay with um, the gay rights movement, right? Like, old and proud is not a thing yet. And until we can sort of get there, we're going to have a hard mm -hmm. time changing the culture. 
Well, absolutely. And I think it also leads into another, you know, another thing that you talk about in your book, which is the fact that particularly with ageism and, and the needs that we have as we age, we are more reactive and crisis driven to our approach than proactive. And um, and that really is true when when somebody needs long term care and services. How often do we see that it comes upon them suddenly as a result of some sort of crisis situation, and then families, individuals are scrambling for assistance and help, um, and because they haven't wanted to think and talk about it. I think, you know, I think not only is it happening individually, but as a society, it's it's happening. We've not wanted to address it ourselves in our personal lives, and we've not wanted to address it as a society. And so the result is that we've got this crisis-driven, reactive approach to the system, which then doesn't work, you know, for so many people. Um, and we need to do better, um, you know, about that. Um, so. Um, I, I really like the way you talk about that in your book as well. Yeah, you know, it's um, I think it's a really important point, as you said, you know, individually in our families and as a as as a society, we need to get out ahead of it. And st and one of the things I really wanted the book to do is to be a conversation starter. Mm -hmm. um, and and it has been. I mean, you know, when I am at a dinner party, often the conversation leads to like, where do we want to live? Do we want to live in a community? And do we want to live alone in our house, houses? And I think, you know, one of the ways, again, that we see the culture not having kept up with the demographics of an aging society is that we have two predominant models for getting old. One of them is that we stay bunkered alone at home, at home for as mm -hmm. long as we can because we're so terrified of long-term care, really, um, because we don't have a reliable system and it's, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, or we are segregated by age with other older people. And, you know, human beings were meant to live among all the ages, right? Yeah. We were not meant to live in just totally isolation. And a guy named Mark Friedman, who runs an organization called Cogenerate, has it, it said old and young are meant for each other. You know, they're built mm -hmm. for each other. So I think we lose a lot of joy and human capacity by by allowing those to be the norms. Um, mm -hmm. And also people get very isolated, both older people and um, and the people who provide and informal caregivers. So, but you know, what I learned from being a prosecutor too is we're not gonna prosecute our way out of these problems. We have to yeah. get much further upstream. And as a society, we have really eviscerated a lot of services and not taken care of providing structures that we need. And one of the reasons that I think that, you know, people are so scared of long-term care is because um, it's not a reliable system. And, you know, despite consumer voices and other advocates' best efforts. So mm -hmm. how do we get to a place where people can embrace living in a community and it feels like a good option as opposed to a terrifying one? Right. Well, and and then how can we all? And I think I think it's a community issue. You know, we all need to look at how we can be supportive of each other, no matter where it is that a person lives. I mean, you know, I firmly believe that um, that people should have choice in in where they're where they live and are able to receive services. But choices are different for everyone, and so we we need a spectrum of options. You know, for people, but. The community should really be rallying around it. That's why, you know, I love the different community groups that have, you know, grown up to support their neighborhoods, um, uh, you know, to help people, you know, stay home or stay connected, you know, to their neighbors. Um, yeah, and here I think there's an important systems point. There are a couple um, systems point, but um, you know, still in the way we fund things. Mm -hmm. Nursing homes are a mandatory, um, are, are mandatory versus home and community-based services, which are still waiver-based. And there are a lot right. of people with waivers and waiver waiting lists. So I think, you know, that is one kind of, there is a lot of low-hanging fruit here in terms of how we improve these systems. And so I think that looking at that pressing there is one area. 
also, um, as you and I have talked many times, um, you know, we need better stewardship over the massive amounts of public funds that are going to long-term care and how they're fun and and how they're used. You know, so we don't we don't really know how, for example, the more than hundred billion dollars, and that's a billion. That's um, right that go to nursing homes and um, CCRCs together are spent. Right. We don't know how much of that money goes for the well-being of residents. That is something that the taxpayers deserve to know and that the people who have stewardship over, uh, stewardship over those funds should know. And then that doesn't even account all the other, you know, billions and billions that are going to assisted living and going to home care, et cetera. So hospice, so we really, really need to do a better job with, I think, the accountability, um, because we need a system that people can trust, right? Too. Um, and well, then, that you oh, go ahead. and you can trust, and I think, especially because people are scattered so much, you know. So, um, you know, when you're looking for long-term care services, and and the way our society is now with and before it fell to women, you know, to care for their older relatives. Well, many women are in the workforce now. Um, and, and, and so we rely on other people to provide us help and support for long-term care and services. And so we need systems we can trust and we need to ensure that people are going to be safe and have quality services. And that goes to the transparency and accountability for the money that we're putting into the system. It's all interrelated. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking about um, sort of what are the, if we think about the buckets for the big, um, the big challenges, and I'm, I'm curious what you think um, about this. I think one is complexity. Like just, mm -hmm. if you think about the long-term care system, if we had tried to create a system that was more confusing. I don't think we could. <laughs> I um, think you're right. Just mind boggling because we've got, you know, nursing homes, assisted living and CCRCs and group homes and different funding streams and different rules and different reputations. And then we've got the five-star system that provides some information, but not always completely reliable information. And like how you and I have been working in this field for decades yeah. and have you know, and it's challenging. I mean, just how consumers should be expected to wrap their minds around this when they're trying to make choices for themselves or their loved ones is is, is really mind boggling. And there's a name for this, I think called administrative burden, which is uh -huh. just like when programs are so complicated that it makes, that that alone makes you just want to cry and bash your head against your computer keyboard when you're trying to figure it out. Um, I think that we need to figure out how to make it simpler for people. Um, so complexity is one of the challenges, I think. Um, a second one is that the, the compass isn't right, right? The way that we've designed mm. the funding streams, they're basically still stuck in the medical model, which is yes. in, instead of that home that we're when we're talking about long-term care, the emphasis is on long-term care. And that is where people live. That is their homes. And so when we're trying to, it's a square peg and a um, round hole problem, I think, because, yep. because the funding streams determine so much of what happens. And the you know people who are making the money off of this system are accustomed to making a lot of money off of certain ways of doing things when in fact that doesn't always really align very well with what people want and need or need right right mm -hmm. and and right and like people you know the data and going way back to Karen Wilson starting Park Place Karen Wilson is an an innovator one of the pioneers in assisted living. And she created a nursing home basically that looked like an assisted living facility where people could lock their doors. They had call bells. They had a lot more autonomy and it was a Medicaid funded place. And it showed that the cost went down and health improved. And so I think, you know, going to sort of some of these autonomy safety issues, giving yeah. people more autonomy and choice over how they live, even though it seems to increase risk. In fact, it improves people's well-being. So I think we've got the wrong compass and it's locked in. And so we need to actually do a better job in exploding that. 
mm -hmm. um, and figuring out a different way to really fund things that are most important to the people we're trying to serve, not to the people who are either, you know, who are doing the serving, but for the population who's intended to benefit here. Mm -hmm. And then the lack of accountability that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. I think those are right on those, those various, those different concepts and, and really do affect not only how we got to where we are, but um, our reasons why we don't have a system that works for, frankly, any of us. Um, and I think, you know, also our really things that we could be looking to, to think about how we could change and move forward into something that might be workable, um, you know, for, for changing the system, for, you know, kind of rethinking what we need to be doing in terms of ensuring that people are going to get services and be cared for, which is something that we all want definitely to happen. So, um, but I yeah, think you're I right. I think there's a lot of, you know, I mean, I think a lot of hopelessness sets in when we're trying to actually work inside of the lines of, you know, yeah. like, you know, the enforcement system or whatever it is. But I think if we really think about, okay, we've got hundreds of billions of dollars going into this system. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. How do we want to spend it? Like, really, it's a challenge for our imaginations to um, yeah. about, like, what is a better way to use that massive amount of money for the well-being of people like you know we know that for example greenhouses and you know places like that that feel like home people do better there we know that people really like co-location when you have you know a library or a or a child care center or something that's co-located so that there's more life you know too often nursing homes especially become islands and there's yep. not communication with the um with the community i'm working with a wonderful woman named ann bastein who has staged plays theater productions in nursing homes where fabulous residents and staff and artists they have re literally artists in residence and it's just you know and you can see the life it it, it be, nursing homes should be community centers where absolutely it's not just like people coming in and giving like a doing a concert where it's a one way street, but where there's real engagement in artistic and community kinds of endeavors that give people a sense of life and right. Purpose. Well, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how many residents that I've talked to that said I can't do one more game of bingo. You know, they want to contribute. People want to contribute. They want to have their voices heard. They want to be engaged. They want to be part of the community. And that's what nursing homes should be. And I think we saw the dangers of isolation through the pandemic, where, you know, I think we lost so many people because they lost the will to live because they were so isolated um, during the pandemic. And that's something that we just can't go back to again. Like that was, I think, a real wake up call for a lot of people as well that, you know, that isolation and I think, you know, kind of all of these factors coming together at once. And I think, um, you know, the book that you've written, you know, also really has hopefully opened people's minds to be thinking more about it, to think about like, where do we go? You know, where can we go and make change? And, and as you're talking about, you know, addressing the low hanging fruit. I mean, I think as, you know, we think about, you know, the advocacy and in, in moving things forward um, and you know, based on the experiences that you've had, based on the research, you know, that you've been doing and in, in writing the book, what are some of the things that, you know, we as advocates and consumers can, can be working towards to kind of help start moving and pushing, you know, in, in these other directions? And what, what are some of the, the pieces that we can be tapping into to start, you know, kind of working down that road? I, I, I said to you earlier that there's a, um, there's an analogy that you use in your book that I just loved. It, it's related to systems change. You talk about laying the track or laying the foundation and then going after the trains to, you know, better, better find your way, you know, down the road and take you where you want to go. So talk about that a little bit and what you mean by that. Well, thank you for that question, because I really hope that the book is used as an advocacy tool. Um, and part of it was my own journey in terms of figuring out, okay, what did I miss? So um, the second to last chapter of the book 
is about is called movement and it's about how what are the components of successful social movements and what had i missed and especially in working on the elder justice act but really the elder justice act is a case study more than anything and so um uh so I'll, I'm going to go back to the train tracks and one yeah. second. The, in that chapter, I have four components. And one of them I love, and it's V-O-T-E. Just, you know, I didn't even <laughs> put that out in the book, but that's what it spells out. So the first one is voices. And so I love that you guys are called Consumer Voice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the voices of in in the context of long-term care, of residents, of families, of ombudsmen, of consumer voice, of, you know, legal services, of the, you know, of the various partners that you work with. Um, because the engine of change for, it, it is storytelling. Um, and, you know, I listened to a podcast with ombudsmen and it was really struck that they too, in their systems advocacy, are talking about storytelling and really i mean i'm so impressed by some of the um some of the things that they're doing in terms of creating forums for residents and families to you know amplify their voices and then connecting them with media connecting them with legislatures etc so that and i think that's it's that's a really important way to amplify the voices it's also a form of organizing which is another yes. thing that we really need to be doing so the the o is for organizations and organizing and like how do we how do we you know if we think about ourselves as a huge school of fish how do we increase our power by swimming in the same direction toward common goals and you know we do need to do that i think because um, chaos doesn't change things as effectively as organizing does. Mm -hmm. um, T are the tools, and there are a lot of organizing tools. You know, there are legal tools, um, and you know, our friend and colleague Allison Herschel has used the law. I think, and her and her colleagues have very effectively. There's policy change. There's fundraising. There's getting data. There's doing research to say, okay, what do the data tell us about? Um, what, you know, is one thing better than another. And there's also communications, strategic communications. How do we shape the message? And how do we shape these stories in an effective way? Mm -hmm. um, and then E is electoral involvement. We need to hold our elected representatives more accountable for what is happening as we age and for long-term care and the fact that we don't have a coherent long-term care system that needs to change. People need to feel like there's a reliable system. Okay. So sorry, I didn't, the train tracks. I'm no, right. those are, listen, those are, that's a perfect uh, way to get into that because I, I think, and I love the VOTE. I love that because it, it, those are exactly what we need people to be thinking about in terms of really, that's what advocacy is all about. All of those different aspects of what you just talked about. And we need people to understand that. So that is perfect. And I think it falls right into your train track analogy, to tell you the truth. Yeah. You know, one thing about the electoral change is that a lot of people think that um, aging advocates have a ton of power, right? Because, because AARP has a ton of power. But most of that advocacy has been focused on, you know, Social Security, Medicare, pensions, et cetera. And I think we need a broader palette of um of uh of, of goal advocacy goals um and so i think and that's a really important role for consumer voice and other mm -hmm. advocates um okay so i learned about the uh, uh, the the it's the what i call the dare principle so most of us have heard about the you know the the drug program in schools called dare and it was in about 75% of schools, everybody, basically the data all showed it wasn't doing what it was set, it, set out to do. That five years later, kids exposed to DARE were still using drugs just as much. And yet it was in all these schools. And the question was, what's going on? Well, it served a bunch of, of different purposes, right? Like teachers got a free period and um, cops got to, you know, sort of be in schools, schools got a little bit of security, you know, there are a bunch of different advantages. So it was serving different needs than actually helping kids. And so, but what, so then, then there was a debate about, should we abolish DARE 
or should we use dare? And basically what people, what the, what one group of advocates said is let's use dare because we've laid the tracks. We have the funding stream. The people who want, like the program, you know, they were fine with improving the service, like improving the drug treatment program. Right. So mm -hmm. That's and and so the way that I wrote about it is like we've laid the tracks, we have the funding, we have the program, we're in the schools. How do we improve the service? And so I think that long term care is analogous, which is why I think there's really low hanging fruit here because we have hundreds of billions of dollars going into long term care already. How do we improve what we're doing so it better? aligns with what people want and need. And so the incentives are aligned with those desires, which have much more to do with what we talked about earlier about it being home. And then sort of the last part of the book, which was the most important for me in a sense is like the capacity for meaning making that mm -hmm. long-term care does not erode people's capacity for meaning making in yeah late chapter of life so that's i did i explain it yes coherently yeah. enough okay absolutely no i i think absolutely and and you know i i do think that all of these different factors you know that you've been talking about working together um really can move us forward uh, as we think about it into aging well and 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 having meaning throughout the balance of all of our lives, no matter how much time we have. I mean, that's the goal, the, you know, right. for all of us. Can I just address the meaning making? Yes, please. I ended up leave, writing about that in my last chapter because that, you know, given the work that really, it came as a surprise to me in a few different respects. Um, one of them is that, cause it, you know, it kind of sounded abstract and all that, even though important, but it really ended up, I mean, the capacity for meaning making is something that we have throughout our lives. And, and there are really concrete components. So one of them is to stay connected with other people, the people we really love, and then to be in community with other people. And that that is something that we need to do affirmatively and we really mm -hmm. need to keep trying to do. Also, the need for purposeful activity. And, you know, I was really struck by the ombudsman saying that for the residents being part of these councils and advocating was also purposeful activity. We want to we want to do something for the improvement of humanity, too. And that is a real sense of purpose. And that was really striking in going to the plays in at the nursing homes, too. We were going into people's homes and could thank them for this beautiful production and that was like, oh, you know, people don't get thanked a lot um, for doing something for others. And that is a really important part of humanity that we then are denied if we don't give people the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. um, then there's this capacity for like creativity and awe. And, you know, that's a really, really important thing. And that can be a sunset. It can be a beautiful piece of music. It can be a book. It can be all kinds of different things. And people, people need that. People need beauty and create and expressions of create uh, the opportunity for expressions of creativity. And that too is something that is, you know, that's cheap compared to all yeah. the stuff we um, spend money on. And so to do more of that, you know, to make sure that that is part of, you know, what happens in long-term care settings, I think is really integral and then the last part was storytelling. And, you know, we're, we're something we're called, human beings are what are called homo, homo narans. We make sense of our existence by how we tell the stories of why we are the way we are and mm -hmm. how we got that way. And so, and a lot of times we don't ask older people about their stories. And so that is a really rich opportunity. And I know that Allison told me that's, you know, one of the things that happened during the pandemic was that even in this moment of despair, asking people about their stories was a really healing and important thing. And so it's both internal in terms of how we make meaning of our own lives and mm -hmm. then telling those stories for others 
is really a transformative, um, can be transformative as an advocacy matter too. Yes. So that, and it was, you know, and that's why stories are the engine of my book too. The stories of people, the stories of policies, the stories of programs. And, and you know, it's just, that allows us to to um to really understand things at a deeper level, I think. Absolutely. I, I think understand things and also connect to them. You can connect to the personal stories. And that I think was, you know, a really effective way of writing your book because you have a vested interest as you talk about your father and your mother-in-law through the book and their stories and, and other people's stories. You you keep going. You want to know what happened. You want to know how, you know, how does it all turn out and, you know, and, and what is the interaction and the reactions, you know, because we're all interested in each other. And, and so we want to hear those stories. I, I think that's right. You know, and, and that is one of the things that we have been strongly promoting at Consumer Voice is the storytelling and hearing from people. And as we're recording this right now in October of 2023, it's Residence Rights Month. And that is one of the things we highlight during Residence Rights Month are people's stories. And we ask people to send them to us that they're available for those interested on our website at um, www.theconsumervoice.org. So, um, but it, it is definitely a way, and I think is also an effective way for advocacy. So um, just, I mean, it's just genius. I think the the book just a, it should be required reading. I think it should be required reading for, you know, people that are students of gerontology. I mean, for everyone, frankly, but certainly people that are students of gerontology, students of advocacy, of policy change. Um, I think that you hit so many marks in this book. And so I just, you know, congratulations on such a job well done. And definitely we're excited to be promoting it and to be promoting your work. Well, thank you so much. And interviewing you, as I have told you, was really important to my thinking about several of the subjects. And I'm really grateful to you for your contributions. And I feel like it is a group portrait in a way. And, you know, I hope it's sort of as a, you know, both uh, both an, an effective tool and also a, kind of a, a love letter of sorts to the people who have devoted so much to improving the lives of so many. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, again, the book for our listeners is The Measure of Our Age, Navigating Care, Safety, Money, and Meaning Later in Life. Um, by M.T. Connolly. You can get it at any bookstore, um, in stores, online. If you Google it, you can find that it's available everywhere, even on audiobook, um, which I saw. Um, and uh, so please go out and get your copy today. Um, and uh, please uh, listen again to this podcast because M.T. has so many great words of wisdom that she has shared with us today and, and the different interviews that you've been doing. Um, but I, I know that folks are going to go out and get the book and listen to it. And thank you so much, MT, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Lori. It's uh, great. It's well, appreciate having your, having you take the time and always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank so you. thanks for joining us for today's podcast. And I hope you'll join us again for our future episodes. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us on Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care. This podcast is a program of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. Make sure to visit our website, theconsumervoice.org slash pursuingquality, where you can subscribe to the podcast, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and find more information and resources. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thank you.